This is Constitution Day. Uh, welcome. Uh, why are we here? Uh, well, what is Constitution Day? Pretty obvious question, but it commemorates the formation and signing of the, uh, the United States Constitution by the Founding Fathers this very day in 1787. Uh, and it also is aimed at recognizing uh, those people who are born in the United States uh, and all like myself by naturalization who have become citizens. So everyone themselves <laughs> <is> celebrate <laughs> being a citizen. I'm a two-year citizen, so this is almost uh, to the day that I've been, uh, uh, two years down the road of being a uh, US citizen. Uh, why are we having the event? Well, we can thank the late Senator uh, Robert Byrd from West Virginia, uh, as he sponsored a law in 2004, uh, designating today as Constitution Day, and it is uh, a legal requirement for schools and federal agencies to hold an educational program uh, on Constitution Day uh, uh, relating to the Constitution, and that's what we've got today. We're very fortunate and privileged to have here uh, Dr. Anthony Champagne, uh, who is our speaker from the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he uh, receives, uh, give you a short uh, summary of his uh, uh, educational uh, attainments and achievements. Uh, he's uh, taught at the University of uh, Texas at Dallas since 1979. He's won their uh, Regents Teaching Award. Uh, he's the author, all those students of mine who are here today, and other <laughs> students, uh, the Texas government textbook. So there is I'm not sure whether he'll do a book signing. I'm sure be happy to oblige. And it is the best-selling textbook in, uh, on the uh, 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 on uh, Texas politics uh, uh, here in this uh, 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 here in uh, Texas, so that's great. Uh, he's also written a uh, book on uh, uh, former uh, House Speaker Sam Rayb Rayburn. We were talking about that at dinner last night, the longest serving uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives from the state of Texas. And he's edited and co-edited nine books and authored over 80 articles in various journals and law reviews. He's also been a Supreme Court Judicial Fellow, so it's very impressive. Received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award and he's done oral histories uh, for the Sam Raven Library and interviewed over 130 persons uh, in Texas and Washington. We were just discussing last night uh, how he uh, became a close friend of former Speaker, uh, House Speaker Jim Wright from Texas. So again, uh, 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 some uh, very important uh, Texas connections with the uh, United States Congress. He's speaking today on the very important topic of voting rights and the Constitution, partisan politics, as you can see going to be discussing uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, the Constitution, and uh, he'll finish looking at a Corpus Christi case. Uh, the, uh, the judge who actually swore me in uh, as a US citizen uh, uh, is at the center of a very important case relating to Texas's voter ID law. And uh, so he'll be talking about that case and he'll speak for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have about 20, 30 minutes for questions, and hopefully we'll have a, a lively discussion about voting rights. But uh, without any further to do, I present uh, Dr. Anthony Champagne. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Well, thanks very much. Uh, this is Constitution Day, and so I would like to talk about voting and the Constitution and how partisan politics are just tied up in this current debate over voting procedures in states like Texas. By far the most important law ever passed involving voting rights is the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It's been amended some, but it is the key voting law in the United States. And from a constitutional perspective, it was passed under the affirmative authority of the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment, you'll see, was ratified in 1870. It's one of the so-called Civil War Amendments. The 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments are ratified in the aftermath of the Civil War. But it provides the constitutional authority for the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. 
Congress cannot pass any law without a, what's called affirmative authority, a power in the Constitution that allows the law to be passed. And the 15th Amendment is that power for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Interestingly, nothing much happens. The, the, the 15th Amendment is ratified in 1870. Nothing much happens regarding protecting voting rights until 1965. It's, it's quite remarkable. You go through almost 100 years where uh, the, the rights of people to vote are basically ignored. And let me just give you a, a one example of how people's rights were ignored. Prior to the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, the state of Mississippi, and I just picked Mississippi, but I could have picked almost any southern state, Mississippi had something called a literacy test. That is, in order to vote, you had to pass a test showing you were literate. And that meant you had to interpret a provision of the Mississippi Constitution that was given to you by a Mississippi voting registrar who then decided whether or not, based on your interpretation of the Mississippi Constitution, whether or not you were literate. If you were white, it was common for white voters to interpret this provision of the Mississippi Constitution. All elections by the people shall be by ballot. If you were white, you could write yes or I agree and you'd be registered to vote. That showed you were literate. If you were black, you would be asked to interpret this provision of the Mississippi Constitution. I won't read through the entire thing, but it deals with the power to tax corporations in the state of Mississippi. Only a highly skilled corporate lawyer would be capable of interpreting that provision of the Mississippi Constitution. And what that meant, of course, was that black people couldn't register to vote in the state of Mississippi. And this was going on throughout primarily the South, not totally the South, but primarily the, uh, the, the Southern states. The Southern states were basically doing all sorts of things to discriminate regarding voting uh, for African Americans, and that discrimination, of course, in those days benefited the interests of white segregationist Democrats. One thing, though, that, that began to happen in the early 1960s, particularly 1964, is the civil rights movement in the South really got started. And one of the big uh, areas of focus was to register African American voters in the South. So African Americans would line up at the courthouse and try to register to vote. Often the voting registrar would go fishing, or would close the office, or would call the sheriff, do anything possible to keep from registering African American voters, but there was a very significant voter registration effort in the South, particularly in 1964. And then, in 1965, how many of you saw the movie Selma? Great movie, except historically inaccurate. One thing you need to keep in mind about Selma is in Selma, Lyndon Johnson is treated as an antagonist. He's treated as someone who really doesn't want to promote the Voting Rights Act. And Martin Luther King forces him to push for the Voting Rights Act. That's absolutely false. Lyndon Johnson wanted the Voting Rights Act and pushed for the Voting Rights Act. But with the exception of that huge historical inaccuracy, Selma is, is really a, a, a superb movie.
This is, of course, a picture of the police uh, beating demonstrators near the Edmund Pettus Bridge in, in Selma, Alabama. The police there acted so violently and so ruthlessly that it seemed to mobilize the non-Southern part of the country in favor of the Voting Rights Act. And the law was signed, of course, by Lyndon Johnson. Here is Lyndon Johnson. He's just signed the Voting Rights Act. And you may see he is handing a pen that he used to sign the Voting Rights Act. He's handing that pen to Martin Luther King. The law has an immediate impact. This is probably a law that had the greatest instant impact of any law ever passed by Congress. And I think this can just give you a quick and really good idea of the impact of the law. In 1960, for example, in Alabama, only 66,000 African Americans registered to vote. 1966, right after the Voting Rights Act, 250,000 registered to vote. It's just incredible. Uh, South Carolina, 58,000 registered to vote before the Voting Rights Act. After the Voting Rights Act, 191,000 registered to vote. So there are huge increases in African American voters in the southern states as an immediate result of the Voting Rights Act. And even though there have been amendments to this law, it basically continued in effect as it was in 1965. One of the most important aspects of the law, after this immediate impact of the law, one of the most important aspects of the law was Section 5 of the Act. Section 5 of the Act is called preclearance. That is, if there's any change in a state's voting procedure, if a state is covered under Section 5 of the Act, that state has to get approval of its voting procedure by either the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. or by a federal court in Washington, D.C. And that's preclearance. So you're changing some aspect of your voting procedures in your state. You've got to, before you change those voting procedures, you've got to basically get approval of that change from the Department of Justice, where the Department of Justice says, okay, this change will not have a negative impact on minorities. That's basically the idea of preclearance. And that's Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act provides a formula that is used to determine if your state or part of a state is covered by preclearance under Section 5. So what we have here are the states and in some cases counties that were covered by the preclearance requirement. They met the standards of the formula in Section 4 and you have to have preclearance under Section 5. The light color is, is uh, Texas, Alaska, and Arizona. They, they were not initially part of preclearance. They were added to preclearance as a result of an amendment. The counties that you see that are sort of gold or yellow at one time had to have preclearance because they were found to have discriminated but they, they were able to opt out of preclearance. They were able to show they had not discriminated over a 10-year period. Interestingly, if you look at voting rights suits, the states that are subject to preclearance, with a few exceptions admittedly, <laughs> 
But the states that are subject to preclearance are also the states that have lost the most voting rights suits. So it would seem that preclearance is really, is really working, right? It's, it's, it's working on those states that are having the biggest problems regarding voting rights. But something happens in 2008. The court decided a case from Indiana that really heralded a new era in voting procedures. Indiana was not a state that was subject to preclearance. So it was not a state that had this history of discrimination against voting uh, by minorities. But Republicans in Indiana passed a voter ID law over the opposition of Democrats. And Republicans said they wanted a voter ID law to stop voter fraud. The problem was there was not a single case of voter fraud in the entire state of Indiana. There hadn't been a prosecution for voter fraud in Indiana in years. But Republicans said, well, that might be because the people committing the fraud were so good at the fraud that you couldn't catch them. And so you needed a voter ID to catch them. Democrats said this is a way to suppress voting by minorities who tend to vote Democratic. Anyway, the Supreme Court in a 6-3 to three decision, the Supreme Court agreed with the Republicans that even though this appeared to be very partisan reasons for the law, it was reasonable and constitutional for the Republicans to pass a law to prevent what appeared to be non-existent voter fraud. So of course what the court's doing here is it's sending a message that some restrictions on the ballot are going to be allowed. This is in 2008. Five years later, Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder. This, folks, is the blockbuster voting rights case. This is the central, the crucial voting rights case. What the court basically said, you notice it's a five to four decision, by the way. What the court basically said is that federal regulations of elections were exceptional and required a significant justification to interfere with state control over elections because running elections was a state power under the Tenth Amendment. You've, you've probably talked about the Tenth Amendment in your classes. You probably uh, heard it referred to as the State's Rights Amendment. The court was saying federal control over elections is really interfering with the right to states. There has to be a compelling, a powerful reason before the federal government can control state elections. And the court said there was no significant justification to interfere with state powers over elections when the formula in Section 4 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that was used to determine what states had to pre-clear when the formula was outdated. The formula was based on discriminatory actions by states 40 years ago. And so the court said that formula is outdated there's therefore no compelling reason for the federal government to interfere with the power of states to run elections on their own. Now, of course, 
Congress could pass a more modern formula. Congress could come back, pass a new formula under Section 4 that allowed for preclearance under Section 5. But Republicans in Congress are opposed to that. They're opposed to passing a new formula. This particular cartoon says that those five justices gutted the Voting Rights Act. Well, that's not quite true. They pretty well damaged the Voting Rights Act. They didn't totally gut it, but they, they, they definitely damaged the act because now you have no preclearance if states change their voting procedures. They don't have to get approval from the federal government to change their voting procedures. This, I, I, I love this cartoon. You've got Chief Justice Roberts unlo unlocking the cell that was holding in voter discrimination. And voter discrimination is saying, free at last, free at last. Thank the Supreme Court Almighty, I am free at last. So, where there's no preclearance, and preclearance had blocked 3,000 voting changes in the past, where there is no preclearance, states can do what they want. And immediately after this decision, states that are covered, that were covered, I should say, by preclearance, start imposing changes in their voting procedures. Texas being one, one of the things Texas did was voter ID. So you might ask, what difference does it make? So what? So what if you have to show your picture when you vote? Small percentage reductions in the vote can make a huge difference. The most extreme, of course, was the 2000 presidential election where George W. Bush carried Florida and therefore was able to get the electoral votes from Florida to become President of the United States, he carried Florida with 537 votes. Small number of votes can matter. There was a study done by the General Accounting Office that found that voter ID laws in Kansas and Tennessee reduced turnout in those states by two to three percent in 2012, with the biggest drop-off being among young, black, and newly registered voters. In other words, the biggest drop-off among Democratic voters. Now, Republicans in Texas say, yeah, but prior to voter ID, 5.37 percent of registered voters participated in the Constitutional Amendment election. After voter ID, 8.55 percent participated. Voter ID had no effect in Texas, Republicans say. The problem is the vote in Constitutional Amendment elections is always low, but is highly variable. So that argument by Republicans really, really just doesn't make empirical sense. I think the most interesting thing about the effect of voter ID is this study just done by Rice University and the University of Houston, a joint study. It's a study of the 23rd Congressional District election in 2014. Uh, Democrat uh, Pete Gallego was defeated by Republican Will Hurd by 2,400 votes. This, by the way, is the only competitive congressional district in Texas. And 2,000 votes separated the, the, the Democrat and the Republicans. It's largely a Latino district. This study was based on a survey of 400 voters. And in surveying the non-voters, less than 
of the people who didn't vote lacked proper ID. But 6% said the primary reason they did not vote was because they thought they didn't have proper ID. And 13% said one of the reasons they didn't vote is because they thought they didn't have proper ID. Four to five times as many of those non-voters would have voted for the Democrat compared to the Republican. So what that means is without voter ID, the Democrat instead of the Republican would have won the election. Voter ID makes a difference. It makes a difference in close elections. So what do you do if you're a Democrat in this kind of situation? Well, what happened was a Democratic congressman from the Dallas area named Mark Vesey decided there's another part of the Voting Rights Act. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act that the Supreme Court had not addressed yet. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act allows private citizens or the Justice Department to bring suit if they believe a procedure is used by a state that is racially discriminatory. It's not as good a provision as preclearance because you have to sue, you have to prove the case, you have to spend the money and time to go to court. But you can sue. And Mark Vesey sued here in Corpus Christi. He sued in federal court under Section 2, and he won. Voter ID was held by the federal court to be racially discriminatory. So the state then appealed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And Mark Vesey still won on some claims, not all claims, but still won on some claims. He won three weeks ago. I mean, this has literally just happened. And he won basically on the argument that voter ID has a discriminatory impact on minorities. Uh, the federal court in Corpus Christi has now been instructed by the Fifth Circuit to hold additional hearings on some issues in the case and to come up with some way of remedying the discriminatory impact of voter ID. It may possibly eliminate voter ID. But it, it, it does seem very, very possible there'll be big changes in terms of voting policies in Texas as a result of this Corpus Christi court. I hope that this, this will be coming up very, very soon, just in the next month or so. So I hope you'll be able to go to the court in Corpus Christi and watch this, because this is major, major litigation. But in the meantime, while everybody in Texas is focusing on voter ID and the end of preclearance, the Supreme Court this fall is hearing another case from Texas that may be even more important. And this is the case, Evenwell versus Abbott. Any of you familiar with this case? This is really big stuff. Sometime probably in November, the Supreme Court will hear this case. And the issue in this case is, do legislators, particularly Texas state senators, do they represent persons or do they represent eligible voters? Currently, they represent persons. You draw a state senate district on the basis of the number of persons in that state senate district. What Evenwell wants to do 
is to draw state senate district in, in state senate districts in Texas based on eligible voters rather than persons. The argument is that Texas has so many non-voters and non-citizens that when Texas Senate districts are drawn on the basis of population, non-citizens are counted for the districts because non-citizens are persons. And since most of the non-citizens are Latino, that means that Latino districts have smaller numbers of citizen voters and large numbers of non-citizen non-voters. And the argument is that gives Latino voters greater voting power in comparison to Anglo districts where there are few non-citizen non-voters. So the argument is that Texas Senate districts should be drawn on the basis of eligible voters in the district rather than persons in the district. I'll give you just an idea of how this argument goes. One Senate district in Texas has 584,000 eligible voters. Another Senate district in Texas has 372,000 eligible voters. They have an equal population, but the number of eligible voters is vastly different. And the, the argument is that 372,000 district uh, is, is a Latino district, and Latino voters in that district have more influence than the white voters that are in the 584,000 eligible voter district. So if that argument is successful, and it's before the Supreme Court right now, if that argument is successful, there will be fewer Latino districts in Texas, there will be less Latino political power, and there will be more districts in Texas that are older, whiter, richer, and Republican. So it would have a huge impact on Texas politics, and eventually would have a huge impact on other states with large Latino populations. And it would mean weakening Latino voting power and therefore Democratic power. So now do you see why the platform of the Texas Republican Party is to repeal the 1965 Voting Rights Act? The Republican Party will benefit from repeal of the Voting Rights Act. The Republican Party will benefit if the Supreme Court decides in favor of Evenwell in Evenwell versus Abbott. So just keep in mind about what we're talking about when we're talking about voting, when we're talking about constitutional law regarding voting. We're not just talking about law. We're talking about partisan politics. When we're talking about voting and the law, we're talking about the selection of government officials. And what that means is we're talking about the distribution of political power in a state. Anytime people talk to you about changes in voting, ask one key question about any change in voting. Who benefits? Because somebody, some interest group, some party, some group of people always benefits. And let me close for now and, and we can have questions or comments or, or, or whatever. Yes? Can you please identify the uh, ID, forms of ID that are acceptable? One form of ID, let me identify one that's not acceptable because I think everyone in this room has that form of ID. Uh, 
Your student ID, not acceptable. Driver's license, gun license, military ID, passport. There are two others. What are the other two? I can't recall. Birth certificate. There's got to be a photo ID, though. Couldn't be. No, a birth certificate's not enough. Passport. There are a couple of others, but I'm sorry. Gun ownership. Gun ownership. Yes, yes, yes. That is part of the ID. It's very, very interesting. It seems to me that that uh, students with state-issued photo IDs at their schools can't use that as a photo ID. I should share this with you. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, Speaker Jim Wright and, and I became pretty good friends over the past 15 years. He just died about a, a month ago at the age of 92. He was, uh, he was a congressman from Fort Worth from 1954 to 1989. Uh, he was responsible for things like interstate highways. Uh, a very, very major figure. He was Majority Leader of the House of Representatives. He was Speaker of the House of Representatives. But when he went to vote in, at the age of 90, he hadn't driven in a couple of years because he was losing his eyesight. So his driver's license was expired. And because he was 90, he hadn't traveled in a while, so his passport was expired. So he took his expired driver's license and he took his expired passport and tried to vote in the Constitutional Amendment election. And they said, no, Mr. Speaker, you cannot vote. You don't have sufficient ID. This was a man who voted for the 1965 Voting Rights Act and was one of the major sponsors of the 18-year-old vote, and he was not allowed to vote because his voter ID didn't, didn't apply. It had expired. So I just want to point out uh, an, an ironic situation in that students can't use their ID card to vote, but come January, if they have a concealed weapons license, you can vote. You can use that, yeah. yes. So I guess that means all of our students should get concealed weapons licenses here at the, at the school so they'll be able to vote. Yes? What would you do about dual credit students who are in the school? I'm sorry? What would you do if, if that did get passed that students could use student IDs? What do you do about dual credit students? Oh, that's, that's not going to happen. You don't need to worry about that. Because that, that, that's not going to happen, not with the, not with the current legislature. The, what is going to happen is basically the Corpus Christi Court is going to either strike down voter ID, or if it doesn't strike down voter ID, things are going to stay pretty much as they are. So that's something you really don't need to worry about. Yes? Sir, when that, uh, when that case is brought back to Corpus, will it be heard by the same judge? Yes, it will. And it's already back in her court. Okay. So I think the hearings on this will probably be in the next few weeks. That's why I would hope that some of you would be able to go and attend this. This is, you would be seeing major, major law being made right here in Corpus Christi. Yes? Who's the current judge in the uh, case here? Uh, remind me of her name, the judge in Corpus. And interestingly, she is mostly she is mostly upheld by the Fifth Circuit, which is a very, very conservative federal appellate court, very Republican, very conservative federal appellate court. There was a hand up behind you. No. Oh, okay. Is there anything being done about the gerrymandering of the districts? Not really. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to be a little cautious there. Uh, there 
there will likely be more gerrymandering because you don't have preclearance, number one. Number two, Evenwell, if the Supreme Court decides in favor of Evenwell, what it will do is eliminate minority, uh, or, or basically it will eliminate Latino districts, or a substantial number of Latino districts. Uh, but gerrymandering has become a huge, huge problem where there are just almost no competitive districts anymore. And the reason is because you can so scientifically draw district lines so that if she is a Republican and he is a Democrat, I'm going to know that and I can draw a district line in the alley between their two houses. So your, your question is, is there anything that's going to be done about gerrymandering? It's probably going to get worse. The odds are I think it's going to get worse uh, as, 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 time goes, as, as time goes on and as there's no preclearance. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, government resources generally are not given out to politically powerless groups. The way you get government resources is by having sufficient political power to demand those resources. So yeah, this is a tremendous weakening of, uh, of Hispanic political power. Yeah, yeah, this, this has huge potential. Huge potential. State of Indiana didn't have a problem with voter fraud. Is there a state that does? Actually, in modern times, there is there is no sufficient evidence of voter fraud in any state. Now there are wonderful stories of voter fraud in Chicago. There are wonderful stories of voter fraud in New Jersey. But in terms of arrests or prosecutions for voter fraud, really minimal throughout the country. But we want to make sure there's no voter fraud, and that's why, if you're a good Republican, you support voter ID. We want to make sure it continues to be a situation where there's no voter fraud. I've got a question about uh, voter registration in Europe. It's automatic. The government automatically registers. Is there a good reason uh, for that not to be the case in the United States, given that uh, it would in significantly increase voter turnout uh, were that to be implemented? No, I know no, no good reason for that. You know, uh, some, some countries have mandatory voting. Argentina, for example, my, my, uh, my wife's home country, has mandatory voting. You are required to vote. Uh, and, and of course we have nothing like that here, but if we did have mandatory voting here, what would happen? What would be the political impact of mandatory voting here? Yes. What you would have is Democrats would win more and more and more elections. And I suspect that you'd have something somewhat like that in terms of registration. Uh, but why do we not have that? Why do we not have something like mandatory voting? Well, we don't have it because Republicans don't want it. Who benefits? Always ask who benefits. Is it California? I thought I just read last week California moving to that. There's something in there. Yeah, I read something about it. I don't think it's mandatory voting, no. but I think it's, it's, it's Regist simplified registration. Right. Every time you register, I think it's every time you register your automobile, I think that's the way it works. Any, any other questions about voting or what's going on in, 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 in Texas? Keep in mind one thing about voting in Texas that I find very, very interesting. When Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison was a senator, she said the Republican Party needs to reach out to Hispanics because Latino political power is the future of Texas. 
And that's probably true. Latino political power probably is the future of Texas. But there's another way that Republicans can gain power other than doing what Senator Hutchison wanted to do. And that is to suppress voting. And something like voter ID suppresses voting by Latinos, by minorities in general, but, but, but certainly by Latinos. And if you're 90 years old, I guess you go and you, you take your driver's test and get a valid driver's license even though you're blind. It's not always as easy as it seems. Or you take off work and lose a day's pay so you can go and get a driver's license. Or perish the thought, get a passport. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems is you're going to lose work. You're going to lose work. And, and, and so even the construction of, uh, of, of times of voting, early voting, all of these things have political impacts on who wins and who loses. <clears throat> It's, it becomes more of an excuse, it becomes more of an excuse when people are hungry. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of people just spot, like, spontaneity, they just surrender, like, I want to go vote. And that's what he's saying, that he wants people to have that. Uh, chance to just say, hey, you know what, I want to vote today. That's it. That's simple. Well, I think really what you're talking about is this narrow view about voting and where it happens and what time, but all that, as to your point, really does make a difference because there's something about offering things at times where people can't go, making it more difficult. Sure. And that there has to be a recognition. Of a a la a la allowing things. voting on weekends right. would make a huge difference right. as opposed to voting on weekdays or on Tuesdays or, or whatever it might be. Right. Well, I know that somebody right now has just put in legislation to have a uh, voter holiday so everybody can be taken off work and go vote. Would you get paid on, on that though? <clears throat> Your holiday doesn't get paid all the time though. Not all the time, but it would be a nice day off to go vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, that was the, the case is that, you know, if you but, voting. But don't you think it's interesting that the state of Texas is not thinking about how to enhance voting by people. It's thinking of how to reduce voting by people. That's what I find absolutely fascinating. To me, we should be talking about enhancing voting, not, not making it harder for people to vote. And again, you have to ask, who benefits from these efforts to restrict voting rather than efforts to enhance voting? So, uh, driver license and passports both cost money to obtain. Are any of the forms of ID you can get a, You can get an ID, that's the sixth one. You can, you can get an ID for free now. You used to have to pay, but you could get an ID for free now uh, that is uh, it's, it's, it's not a driver's license ID, but it's a, it's a state photo ID. Uh, you still have to go through the, prob the trouble of applying for it and that sort of thing, but you can get a non-driver's license ID now, and now you don't have to pay for it. For a while, you did. Don't so you pay for the birth certificate if you don't have a... Yes, a, yes. Yes, then you need your birth certificate. That's true. So there's always the bureaucratic paperwork involved. When was that 
Actually, I think that was changed as a result of the judge's decision in, in VC. Yes. Anything else? Statistically, they are. I'm, I'm not assuming, I'm looking at the statistics. <laughs> there's a difference between, st there's a difference between assumptions and social fact. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the idea is you try to hold on to power. You got power, you try to hold on to it. I know this sounds incredibly crass and nasty, but this is the way politics works. If you've got power, you do what you can to hold on to it. You don't freely give it up. That's why it took demonstrations in Selma, for example. You don't freely give up power. Oh, I thought your hand was up. Just scratching. Anything else? I just wanted to announce that if anyone did not sign the sign-in sheet, I have them up here before you all leave. Thank you. Okay, thank you.